Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 97. 97. These are dragging, these 90s. 97. It's so close to 100. <laughs> Are you how are you how are you, Nick? How 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 are you? How I'm how? okay. You're okay. I think. It's it's a we've done this about twelve times now. I don't know what's going on. You're uh, fine when I came in and you've just lost your mind. I have just, it's gone horribly wrong. Y- you've had your Negroni. That normally perks you up. It does, yeah. For some reason, my, my brain is just all over the place this week. Is it like a secret poison Negroni? <gasps> Any poisonings this week? Is it the Negroni? <laughs> the Negroni. <gasps> Has someone slipped something? Someone could have slipped something into your Negroni. But uh, mm, it wasn't me. I had to set up a series of cameras protecting the poisonous cabinet. Oh, yeah. So, we have a full-on security absolutely. system. Oh, lasers and <laughs> machine guns and all sorts going on. If anyone other than you goes for yeah. the cupboard, then there's a whole gated system absolutely. that comes down. <laughs> yeah, indeed. I want small attack dogs. All sorts going on. Protect the chateau. <laughs> <laughs> oh, char- chartreuse hasn't been out for a while. Mm. <laughs> what do you think would happen if you put some chartreuse in the Negroni? Oh no, I think that would be very bad. Oh no, you're not gonna you're not no, gonna go down no, that road. I, I think that that way would be unpleasant. Or could it be the secret to everything? Or genius, or yeah, potentially. <laughs> it's one of those things. It's a fine line between madness and, and genius, <laughs> isn't it? So. <laughs> and you're just skating down that line, aren't you? <laughs> so, who knows? I might, I might try it in a minute and then vomit everywhere. That's nice. It's, uh, well, it's fun for you, isn't it? This is fun for me. This is fun for It made even more fun by the, the incident in a glass that you just gave me. Well, actually, an incident in a can. In a can. See, I didn't make any of this. I just produced a can. This is your hospitality for non-drinkers. When someone's drinking, you're like, <laughs> would you like a cocktail? I'll mix you up something. <laughs> it comes out with beautiful accoutrement and smoke and lasers. <laughs> <laughs> you don't okay, drink. You, this has been in the fridge for three years. <laughs> Have that. And you've given me the brand, sorry, is Seedlip. It's their Garden 108, which I've never tried, uh, and a cucumber tonic. See, it sounds delightful. No. It sounds just like your sort of thing. You it's, love a cucumber. It's, but, <laughs> where are you basing that on? I what? know. You've eaten cucumber before. I've eaten lots of things before. There we go. <laughs> Famously love a cucumber. Famously. Never seen without a cucumber. Yeah. Known in all the boroughs for your cucumbers. <laughs> I'm just there eating a cucumber sandwich, hanging out on the corner, peeling one for no reason. No, well, it does sound like, oh, a lovely summery, lovely twist on a gin and tonic. Oh, it's just cucumber and grass yeah. and something musty. Something musty is going on. Earth, I think. Well, that, that potentially could be the three years in the fridge. Um. <laughs> so it's not just a terrible non-alcoholic drink it's expired and is growing its own ecosystem it sounds charming when you say it like that oh god I just took another sip I don't know what's happening <laughs> Oh, you know when you get a really pungent flavour and it just won't leave your taste buds alone oh that's what's happening now I keep going back to it thinking it'll be okay <laughs> any poisonings this week you mm. that's the plan I agree yeah absolutely it's not, you're not stopping drinking though are you I'm just thirsty. <laughs> and you won't give me anything else. I'm like, a cup of water, no drink No the drink, can. drink the can of doom. <laughs> well, speaking of the can of doom and just advising people not to not drink, I think it's time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. Yes, we should indeed. Thank you very much to you, to Nicole Matten Hopkins. To Catherine Culver. To Lisa Robinson. To Renea Barnes. And Lowbrow78. Ooh, that's a good name. That's a good name. Thank you very much, you lovely people. Thank you very, very sexy, sexy Patreon subscribers. Lovely. We've had fun on Patreon this week, I believe. Did we? We went to the, uh, we went to the Hellfire Club in Dublin. We dude. Mm, we do. We do. <laughs> we do <dude> indeed. <laughs> it was very good. It was very good. It was fun. Sorry. It was lovely. It was <laughs> Let's just agree it was fine. <laughs> It's going to be one of those episodes that is just entirely insane. Those are always the good ones. Maybe I'll get drunk just for the hell of it. <laughs> we also had a mini episode this week. You weren't there. Oh, yes, you did. I wasn't invited to that one. I went to a podcast party without you, for <laughs> one. <laughs> I was very lonely. No, did a little roundup of all the dry January fake spirits that we have been trying this month, that I have been trying. And yeah, if you haven't listened to it, pop on over there if you're thinking about doing any purchases, because those are my best buys. Mm. And I haven't mentioned any ones that you shouldn't. So if I don't mention them, don't buy them. 
<laughs> Which is yes. bad advice because there are many drinks. Yeah, there's in the a world. lot of things you haven't mentioned before. All right, well, I'm mentioning the seed lip. Don't bloody buy that. Maybe seed lip do lovely, lovely, lovely other things, but this is just, you need to answer to your people of no, why you have done this to I their faces. The, the, the grassy, the grassy garden one is, is garden one is, is not. I've had that before and it's, it's not overly nice. Yeah. The normal box standard seed lip is actually fine. Garden one is just grass and peas. Well, thank you for giving it to me. Yeah, pleasure. Lovely. Well, you, I thought you might like it. You again, like again, thinking that I like grass and peas grass and, and, peas and, and cucumber. cucumbers. <laughs> no, it's right, right up your street, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nick, are you ready? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> to drink cocktails and talk about poison. Yes. Yes, I am. Or, or you know what, we could just pull the ripcord on this <laughs> drink, do it, just do drink it. poison and talk about cocktails. <laughs> let's get into that point. <laughs> <laughs> let's maybe do both. Okay. 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 Let, let's start with the first one and see where it leads. My episode this week, hooray, 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 but obviously we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell. That will mm. flavour our cocktail of the week. And mm. this week's ingredient is mm. scones. Classic, classic cocktail, liquidy ingredient. It is. Or is it scones? Scones. I say scone. I have to say I'm a scone person. I think I say scones. I never remember each time. No. You know me and my pronunciations. I sometimes go scones. Sc- uh, scones. 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 Twelve scones. Twelve scones. Now, in England, scones are usually served with a lovely combination of clotted cream and jam at yes. an afternoon tea. Sometimes you have a cheese scone. And let's don't put jam on the cheese scone. That's not so good. They're a big thing in the UK. They're a big thing here. And Absolutely big, 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 big fights will be had over whether you put the cream on first and then the jam or the jam and then the cream jam then cream do you yeah jam first cream was up well see now you said that i think cream then jam well you're wrong and we'll have a fight i don't know which it. one's which i don't know which one's cornish which one's Devonshire. <laughs> i don't know which way around it is but i know one of them's wrong wherever you were you just go no you're wrong look at me <laughs> no it's 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 jam and then cream but i, I don't know which one that is <laughs> okay listeners tell us all so with scones scones yeah, scones scones, scones, scones. As your ingredient, your mm. inspiration, what have you come up with, Nick? Well, say, not overly known for their liquid form, scones. Um, blended? Well, I do think perhaps I could blend some scones. I mean, I'm very partial to a scone. A blended scone, probably, I don't think, I think it's going to retain a lot of moisture. Because they're crumbly and dense, yes. aren't they? So I thought I might actually sort of move past the scone. Move scone. past it? I've okay. moved past it, and I've gone to some of the accoutrement uh-huh. that surround uh-huh. the scone scone scone. <laughs> I've gone with a slightly jam-based Oh, have cocktail. you? I've, I've taken the jam and i run with it. Very good. Yeah. So what have you come up with I've with the jamminess? I've made my own cocktail. You've made your own I cocktail? Have in, I have in, invented my own cocktail, <gasps> which is very exciting. What's it called? It's called a uh, jam daiquiri. A jam daiquiri. <laughs> That's not very exciting, but still, yay! Oh, well, fuck you! <laughs> I think you're going to come up well, with a really good, weird name. Because you're not having any. <laughs> I get to have a sip. I get to have a little sip. If it's good, sip. then I'll give it a funky name. Oh, that's really exciting. Yay, a Nick original. We love yeah. a Nick original. Now, as it's still dry January, I'm still making virgin cocktails, as it were, to please the non-drinkers out there. <laughs> now, I looked at scones. And I also went with the jam base. <laughs> Great minds think alike and all that. Indeed. Stuff. I was thinking, you know, cream. Could we go with the clotted cream? I, I did thought I almost went with like a strawberries and cream type Ooh, thing. Yeah. But I thought that's more... Is that really... You know, but I, did, but I didn't. We had... I had quite a creamy non-alcoholic cocktail last week, which was basically just a big old chocolate milkshake. Is very true. Which was very delicious. Oh, that I am going to make a non-alcoholic version of that classic, a bramble. See, I almost went with a bramble, but it doesn't have jam. No, but the non-alcoholic version does. Non-alcoholic version does, okay. The version I'm making does. (laughs) Your classic bramble doesn't involve jam. It uses, um, was it creme de mire? Creme de mire. De mire, which is the blackberry liqueur. Indeed it is. Um, But I am making a non-alcoholic version of it. I'm improvising as I go. Two delicious sounding cocktails. Mm. (laughs) Well, I think it is high time for us to go into the poisonous cabinet kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. See you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. So, Nick, what a lovely collection of pink-hued drinks mm. we have. Oh, what Indeed. jammy goodness. Jammy, 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 jammy. We're feeling jammy, dare I say. 
<laughs> so we have the jammy daiquiri or jam daiquiri? Well, it's a jam daiquiri. If it's good, I've got another name for it. If oh, it's okay. bad, it's going to stay with the jam daiquiri. Lovely. All right. So, so you're not going to talk us through it first? Let no, no. We're just, I'm just going to give it a go. Sip for you I've, and sip for me. I've made this up entirely. I've never had it before. <laughs> okay. Oh, he's going in. He's going in. Oh, that's a good reaction. There we are. Okay. I'm, I'm intrigued now. There are no words. Okay. I am also going to dive in and see if it's the same to me. I mean, that's... Mm. See? That's quite nice. I like that. Yeah. I, I, the jamminess mm. I was expecting was, uh, you know, when you say jam, you kind of go, you're going to go, jam is the first taste that you have, that overly sweet, fruity, blah, explosion. But that's nicely subtle, Nick. Subtle, subtle jam. Subtle. I might, next time, I, I'm, I will make this again. And I may put more jam. <laughs> and then next time I'll put less jam. Perfect amount of jam. Okay, well, talk us through it. Talk us through your creation. So there's jam. Jam. What kind of jam? Strawberry jam. With strawberry jam. Well, I thought that, could, that works well with the scone. Some rum. Rum. And so hence the daiquiri. Of course. Thing. White rum. White, white rum. Bad oh. fan. Bad fan. And then some lime. Lime. Delicious. Very lime. daiquiri. Daiquiri. Nice. Uh, and then some orange bitters. Ooh, the orange bitters. Nice. Yeah. Nice twist. Indeed. So, now I, so normally, say daiquiri is rum, lime, sugar. Mm-hmm. Then put any sugar in. I thought, ooh, probably the jam's probably got a bit of sweetness going on there. Yeah. The jam bit tart, so I dialed back on the lime as well. I thought, ooh, oranginess. And yeah. Yeah. You could go really either way on that the next time you make it again, because you could up the jam quota, as I you said. I think I will try up the jam. Because then it would make it a bit sweeter. But then the great thing about a daiquiri is the, the sharpness of the lime, too. Well, oh, no, there's a hint of fruit coming through in the background there. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm overwhelmed by my own genius. <laughs> Just the subtle strawberry yeah, flavours. Subtle strawberries. What a good invention. Yeah. So so what's the alternate my, name? My, my, my new, cri- my, I'm going to rechristen it. I'm going to christen it. The Who Lives Here. Who lives here? Yes. Why have you called it that? Because it's on my poster up there. It's on my picture. Oh, yes. This is, again, great podcast Great material. podcasting thing. Everyone look at the picture in my house. <laughs> Nick has a very beautiful photograph uh, framed on his wall. I think your dad took that. My dad took that of an abandoned asylum near here. <laughs> Which is us <laughs> through and <laughs> Which through. Which is quite appropriate. And someone has graffitied who lives here in a big spooky way at the end of a corridor? And you, you framed it. It's and I framed it. It's an yes. amazing picture. Who lives here? Jam lives here. I think you'll find jam. <laughs> or a mental patient who has gone, I got jam for trousers. Jam. Hey. Got jam. I like jam. I like jam. I like <laughs> jam. And there's a tiny pot of jam, Nick, in the corner of the picture. We should share a, pic- uh, a photo of the picture yeah. and then people can commission it from your father and it will become a huge internet meme thing. Yes, hashtag who lives here. Hashtag who lives here. <gasps> Gasp. Lovely. What a lovely... Yeah. Drink. Now, I have mixed you up. Yeah, you have. A take on a bramble. Nick very kindly helped me out with some crushed ice because that's what a bramble needs. So have a taste and then I'll talk through what's in it. Mm. I have not shied away from the jam. I'm just going to put that out there right now. <laughs> it looks very, <laughs> very jammy. jammy. Okay, let's give it a go. I'm going. Mm. Oh, the straw doesn't work. The, the crushed ice is too uncrushed. Oh, yeah, that is true. <laughs> I think the crushed ice has absorbed everything. <laughs> uh, oh. It's got- it's very icy. It's very, it's, it's, it's very jammy. <laughs> you have won the jam walls. I've got some liquid. <laughs> I found some liquid, Nick. you got to really dig for it. Oh, I like that, though. Mm. It smells good. Yeah. I can't, I'm, my straw, I'm not getting into the straw. Just shove it I'm right just, to the bottom, Nick. Smelling it a lot. You've got to shove it right to the bottom and then you'll get some. <laughs> I think your no, straw no, has frozen. No, still no. <laughs> I think it has. I think the straw, the jam has frozen inside the straw. Because you need to taste some of the liquid, because I'm quite pleased with that, actually. Mm. Oh, I mean, it's it's fruity. <laughs> right, okay. I mean, it's good. It, Yay! it, it tastes of jam, I'll give you that. <laughs> okay, so what I've done is the classic bramble calls for gin, a hefty measure of gin, lemon juice, and then you would put in some sugar syrup and the aforementioned creme de mûre, which is a blackberry liqueur, which is very, very delicious. So what I've done instead is I took some of the non-alcoholic pink gin that I've got, which has got blackcurrant flavour through it. So blackcurrant, blackberry, who's to know the difference? They're both, they're both black. They're both black. 
mixed in with lots of lemon juice. Couldn't find any kind of blackberry, blackcurrant syrup. So Nick suggested get a hefty measure of jam and shake that all together in the shaker. Normally what you would do is you'd put the, the liquor and the lemon juice over crushed ice and then you'd drizzle, drizzle, drizzle. The, drizzle the blackberry liqueur over it to make it look very beautiful and very tasty and fruity. But because we didn't have that, we thought we'll mix it together. And I put a lot of jam in there. Oh, yeah. A lot of ice as well. A lot of ice. Well, that was me, so... But yes, but that'll melt down quite nicely. But oh. it looks really pretty. It's the best one so far. Yay! Yeah, that's good. I like that. But yeah, that one, it's a good gin to have with a tonic because it doesn't taste a million miles away from I, the gin. I would have that any time. Of a, a summery, afternoony barbecue type thing. I'll have, I'll, I'll have that any day of the week. If that was served up to you, you wouldn't be going, oh, it's missing the gin. No, not at all. Yay! No, I, it's, it's perfectly delicious. Hooray! But I love jam. So. <laughs> you do love jam. <laughs> jam, 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 jam. Oh, we are ending our final dry January episode and Nick has converted, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> no, it's frowning. Mm. But it's a success <laughs> with you, yay. And, yeah. it's, and it's fun as well. You'll have something to do during the episode trying to melt the, all the crushed ice. You'll just hear me crunching all the way through for the next hour now. That's a really good non-alcoholic cocktail then, I think, guys. Mm. Mix up a bramble. You shan't be disappointed. And my who lives here? Who lives here? Deliciousness. Oh, okay. Yeah, well done. Oh, what a what a day oh, we've had. What a success. Let's just finish now. We, we can't <laughs> top this. Oh, no, we can. We can. We oh, can, okay. Nick. Promise you a good story. This is a really good one. It harks back to our roots. We have got jealousy, rivalry, moustaches. Excellent. Confectionery. Ooh, nice. Poison. Nice. And murder. Poison confectionery. Maybe. Maybe. We have all sorts. And we have scones. And scones. Scones are petty. Oh, how exciting. This is a one-track recording, so there will be crunching, crunching all the way crunch, through. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Well. Eating ice and M&Ms at the same time is going to be really <laughs> noisy. We're going to tell the tale this week of Herbert Rao's Armstrong. Armstrong. <laughs> yes, that is his name. Okay. We've started well. <laughs> Do you know the name Herbert Armstrong? No. No. By the should end, of this, you shouldn't. Probably most people don't. He is famous for one thing, and you'll discover what it is at the end of this is it case. Murdering people. It is murdering people, yeah. but there's a very specific <laughs> thing that he is now famous for. But he's oh. not that famous. But he, he should be. It's a thing that he's. <laughs> I mean, you get milk in it, so let's, let's go with <laughs> <Really>? it. <laughs> <laughs> you get to the end of it, and you're going to go. That was it. Just a stupid bit. No, Herbert Armstrong was born in 1869 in Devon. Where the cream Ooh. teas come from. Is that your entire link to it's scones? Not, it's <laughs> not the link. And literally five minutes before I started reading this, I went, oh, cream teas, Devon. <laughs> <laughs> now, he was born into a family, not incredibly wealthy, but they were very determined to give him a good education. Other family members raised enough money to make sure that he was able to go to a good school. He showed early promise academically mm -hmm. and he was accepted into St. Catherine's College, Cambridge. Oh, fancy. That's yes, fancy. fancy. From a, you know, not very well-off family, that's pretty good. And that's where he studied law. When he was at Cambridge, oh, little factoid, he was a spare cox for Cambridge in the boat that's race. That's a rowing thing. That's a rowing thing. He's a very slight man, five foot. I don't know what the cox does. Is that the, is that the person who calls the, the sort of timings and things? He sits on the boat and shouts. That's the that's the cock. Keep rowing, yeah. keep rowing. <laughs> I don't know if they do anything Row, else. Oh, you <laughs> bastards! He's the guy at the front with, with the, the big drum and the whip. <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Nice. Excellent. Oh, that was him. That'd be much more fun. But he is only five foot, mm. slight man, about seven stone in weight. So probably is quite good as a coxswain. Light and glides across the water. Indeed. Uh, he has an excellent moustache. Excellent. All the photos of him, which I will share. Very, very good moustache. Good moustache action going on. A very round, piercing eye. He's just slightly unsettling. <laughs> Qualified in 1895. Gained an MA from St. Catherine's as well. He practised law for a while in Liverpool, then moved back to Devon to uh, Newton Abbott. Aww. Devon famous for its wonderfully named places and he set up in a law firm there he's working for another firm and while he was back in Devon he also joined the territorial army while continuing to build his reputation as a solicitor quirky little fact here about him do you remember we covered the story of John Babacan Lee I um, yes I do indeed yes the man that couldn't hang mm. Herbert Armstrong well, he was approached by John Babacan Lee's mother for help in the case oh. so he was briefly involved in that case he wrote to the local MP to try and appeal for him to be freed from jail uh, it didn't work, but they couldn't hang him in the end, so hey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, small world. Now, while building his career in Devon, Herbert met a lady named Catherine Mary Friend. That was her Aww. maiden name. Yeah. A romance began between them. Now, Catherine, oh, lovely lady, was said to be loud, domineering, and an unpleasant lady in general. <laughs> Classic romance material. Yet the two were soon married. 
Um, <laughs> a little more on Catherine later, but the pair were wed. Well, she was a right goer, she was. So. <laughs> she was keen, let's give it that. They would go on to have three children, two girls and a boy. He's now set his sights on having a practice of his own, and he spots a vacancy for a managing clerk in a firm on Hay on Wye in Breckenshire. Ooh, fancy. Fancy where the literary festival yeah, is. Indeed. He moved the family to the area. He bought a very large home called Mayfield in the nearby and splendidly named valley Cutsup Dingle. Cutsup Dingle. Cutsup Dingle. It's no. a real place. No. Right on the border between England and Wales. Herbert has come to the area to run his own practice and he has now joined the firm Cheese and Cheese. Cheese and Cheese. Cheese and Cheese, lawyers. Okay. Yes. The Cheeses, Mr. and Mrs. Cheese. Mr. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Cheese. Mr. and Mrs. Cheese. They own the practice. They were one of only two law firms practicing in the area. The other run by a Mr. Griffith. And both the Cheeses and the Griffiths were Welsh and coexisted quite amicably, I think, as sort of rivals for years. But all was not well within Cheese and Cheese. Oh, no. A dairy intolerance had broken out. Mr. Cheese was quite unwell. And very sadly died shortly after oh, Herbert Armstrong Mr. joined them. Cheese. Poor Mr. Cheese. Sad as this was, it was a very fortunate turn of events for Herbert mm. that he was able to take over the firm and it became Cheese and Armstrong. Let's go. Well, Mrs. Cheese can't do it by herself. She can't. She, she can't. Not any person. And she particularly can't do it as she died one day after her husband. Oh, no, that would be problematic. Yes. yes. Dead women can't really run it's, law it's, firms. Yeah, dead people in general. Women, men, no one. No particularly one women, they find it difficult. Particularly women. They are somewhat <laughs> problematic in doing things when they're dead. Rotten luck. But now Herbert is the head of his own law firm. Fancy. He has a big house, a loving family. Things are looking up for him. Mm. That's not to say everything was particularly cheery at home. We mentioned Catherine, now Mrs Armstrong. She benefited greatly from her husband's business. She mm. had an income of her own from the business of £2,000 a year. Nice. Yeah. Yet that did not make her any more loving and kind to her husband. She was more in favour of bossing him around, ruled the household, liked to set a, have a strict set of rules mm. for him to abide by. Herbert being such a slight man, it was commented that she literally towered over him. <laughs> And her behaviour was not unnoticed. Respectable woman. Respectable. Respectable woman. Not very respectful, we would say. Not of her husband. Oh, so a few things she insisted on. Uh, There would be no drinking. No, none of that. No drinking, unless he was ill. Yes, okay. We need a brandy for your your cold or a a whiskey if you're a bit poorly. You would think so. She sort of went for a different one. Um, Only medicinal purposes. When they were out with others, she would embarrass him by commenting on that he couldn't drink or would purposely say in front of others, oh, I think you may have one glass of port. It will do your cold good. I don't like this woman. I Mm. feel we would not get on. Well, even worse, Herbert was only allowed to smoke in one room in the house. Oh, God. One smoking room. Wasn't allowed to smoke outside. Okay. Which is weird. That is weird. That is weird. But one designated room. She would reprimand him in public if he was working late or if she met him after work you know, for keeping the servants waiting. My personal favourite, she turned up at his sports club when he was playing a tennis match and told him he had to come home as it was his bath night. <laughs> yes. Bath time for you, Bath Herbert. time for you. Apparently she did this regularly at parties. Yeah. Like You have to come home, it's your time for your bath. So weird mothering yeah, sort there's, of... Yeah, there's something weird going on there absolutely yeah clearly controlling and domineering Mm. Herbert went along with this but then somewhat ironically the outbreak of the first world war was a positive turning point (laughs) for Herbert he escaped to the trenches (laughs) (laughs) well he didn't escape to the trenches as I said he used to be a member of the TA he had joined the territorial army and he had done well there so he was called up to help the home efforts and he was captain he was promoted to major he was deployed around the country around the UK to help the forces also served a spell in France just before the war ended so he didn't see any very dramatic combat it mm. seems but 45 at this time he's away from his horrid wife <laughs> That's a and in the company of a lot of young men who respect him now mm. look up to him well, he's yes. a major so that's fancy all these people looking up to him and also soldiers well they get a lot of attention while on tour shall we say uh. and Herbert was very happy to indulge these attentions he was seen with many pretty young girls much younger than him courting them having affairs while he's <clears throat> away from home oh yes suddenly he's not got his domineering wife telling him what to do he was having the time of his life so much so that he was probably the one English person who was disappointed when the war <laughs> ended he had to return home to his practice and his wife back in Hay on Wye the firm was ticking over with his staff but his rival, Mr. Griffith, 
was now pretty frail. Armstrong naturally offered to merge the businesses, take on his clients, don't worry, I'll handle everything. But Griffiths, no, he had other ideas. Um. Enter Oswald Norman Martin, the firm's new partner. Ooh. Instead of Mr. Griffiths dying and Armstrong be able to sidle in there and go, I shall be the only lawyer in the village, Oswald Martin He's is going to take over. Oswald. Yes, Oswald. Oswald, what's described about him, he's younger. He'd been invalided from the army, but he'd had a head wound and that affected his facial muscles. Still, he was a match for Armstrong and Griffiths Martin, the Griffiths Martin firm, continued to do excellent business. Uh, Mr. Griffiths died in 1920, but the firm continued to thrive. Now, Herbert was back home. He tied himself up in quite a few costly legal cases, one even involving a land dispute in which Martin was the opposing counsel and the bills were racking up and it was becoming a little bit stressful. And, of course, he was once again on the receiving end of his wife's nagging rules. That's never fun. In 1920, after a summer visit to London, where he was said to have dined with a young lady, very clearly not his wife, Herbert came home and had developed a real interest in gardening. (laughs) Okay. Yes, his beautiful big house had a very lovely garden, but Herbert, oh, he was troubled. He was troubled by the sheer number of pesky dandelions in the garden. Dandelions was almost a secret ingredient, but I thought okay. that would be cruel. That, that would be, be obsessing. Too many dandelions, but okay. it just won't do. It just won't do. Mm. So off he went to the local chemist to pick up something to deal with the weeds. We know what the best thing is for weeds. What could it be, Nick? Could it be, I mean, it's arsenic. Arsenic! Arsenic alarm! Arsenic alarm! <laughs> I must admit, in almost 100 episodes, I've never heard of arsenic being used as a weed killer. It gets so much better, Nick. Fly killer, <laughs> people killer, yes? No, I've never heard of it either. Mm. So, the chemist, oddly enough, was the father-in-law of Oswald Martin. Small area, mm. but... Mm, yeah. Small town. But that does have a bearing later on. So Herbert went home and administered the weed killer to the dandelions. Now, how do you normally do uh, lay weed killer? I would say with some sort of spray. Mm-hmm. You scatter uh, it, maybe. Or scattering, yes, indeed. If it's a pellet form, then scatter, yeah. yes. That's good. Um, or you could individually inject every single dandelion <laughs> with our I mean, that's dedication. That really is. <laughs> this is what he did. Some people say he used a syringe, but he definitely made holes in every single one of the dandelions and put the arsenic in it. Okay. Rather than just doing what a normal now, person think, would no, do. Things, I imagine that's his wife telling him to do that. I, I can see her <laughs> being sort of, make sure you get every one of them. Take the syringe. Take the syringe. <laughs> I mean, it's a sight. It's going to be a scene if you walk past that and someone just cackling over a dandelion <laughs> with a syringe. But the dandelion's dealt with. All should be well. But in August that year, but weeks later, poor Mrs. Armstrong is quite ill. She was pale suffering from frequent vomiting fits, had heart murmurs, even paralysis in her hands and feet, as well as suffering hallucinations. I'm imagining she was hallucinating being chased by dandelions or something. <laughs> <laughs> Crawling into the house. Crawling into the house, <laughs> coming through the windows and all sorts. This is an army of dandelions with syringes. The doctor visits and gives his very sensible prognosis. She's insane! That Well, yeah, pretty much. Women who complain of any ailment, they're crazy, off to the asylum with you. Vomiting, heart murmurs, any of that. Madness! She's totally mental, have her committed. And she (laughs) was committed to an insane asylum for six months. Well, she's a lady person. She's a lady person. Can't can't be helped. It is suggested later on that her hallucinations and her visions were played up quite a bit. She was also known to be a hypochondriac. I think that can fit in with the narrative. Yeah, she doesn't sound like the most reasonable or stable person to begin with. No. I think if you are a hypochondriac, that can sort of be put aside when there's lots of physical evidence of you really being sick, particularly puking and and heart palpitations and you can't move parts of your body. This might have just been a cry wolf situation where the doctor said, the next time you bloody call me out, I'm having you committed. And she calls and like, I'm puking for Britain right off to the asylum. I bloody warned you, didn't I? <laughs> the spell does Catherine some good, shockingly. Yeah. Being away from home, having some rest and relaxation, when she requests her release, uh, her husband agrees and she returns home in January 1921 and he goes out to get more arsenic for her return. We don't want those dandelions bothering no, her. No, absolutely. I mean, she, she's obviously quite opposed to the dandelions. Traumatising so, her. So, yeah, so they need to clear out the garden before she gets back. But all too soon, Catherine falls ill uh... again. And Herbert is the dutiful husband, sitting by her bedside and reading to her, leaving work early just to be with her, mopping her brow, shoving arsenic down her throat, all the things that a loving husband should do. 
But by the 22nd of February, Catherine Armstrong dies. Her doctor records the death as gastritis, aggravated heart disease and nephritis, which is an inflammation of the nerves. Mm. Her last words are reportedly... Don't alone! (laughs) Her last words were, I'm not going to die, am I? I have so much to live for, my husband and my children. Aww. Aww. That's a bit sad. Even though she's domineering and... Ah, fuck you! (laughs) She does love her kids and her husband. Mm. There's there's apparently no disputing that. She never spoke ill of them. She just ordered them around their whole life. The servants close all the curtains in the house as a mark of respect. Herbert, when he returns home from work, opens them all up again immediately. Well, it was dark. And he wrote in his diary that night, Kay died. I'm free! (laughs) <laughs> just Kay died that's it didn't even bother to write her whole name like ah not wasting any more ink on that bitch four people attended her funeral mm. not a popular lady it would seem no, no no I think everyone was sick of her just turning up and going it's your bath night you're yeah. not even my wife go away mm. So including Herbert obviously he was there though he spent much of the day talking about fishing rights I'm not sure to who, because there's four people there. Maybe the priest the and priest, the corpse. Yeah. <laughs> like, fishing rights. I'm trying to give your wife a service here. <laughs> the priest has got his, his rod in the back. <laughs> <laughs> They're just I'm like, going fishing after this. <laughs> quick service. You know, <laughs> right, off. And then down the river. <laughs> down the river. As after his wife was in the ground, Herbert was quite the host at his home, throwing parties, inviting all manner of pretty young things to visit him. Just three months after his wife's death, he was already engaged to a much younger woman, it was said. His practice is doing well, and he's also a clerk at this point to the justices of Hay uh, and Paincastle, various places in the area. He's hoping to have similar positions. So he's so close to to having everything he Mm. wants, but there's still an obstacle. Oswald Martin. Dear old Oswald. That other law firm that just keeps getting good clients and to whom he now owes money to because that land dispute did not end in his favour. It's his business rival and Martin is now pressing Armstrong to complete the long overdue bills in relation to that property sale. He owes almost £500 in fees. So instead of making business arrangements to pay the bill, Herbert invites Martin to tea at his house. Mm. He invites him about 20 times. Hmm. This is no exaggeration. Martin just is saying, can we have a business meeting? He's like, no, you must come for tea. I hope to see you soon for tea. Tea and scones and jam and buns. He's seeing buying tea and buns in their masses. And Martin's like, I don't, I don't want tea. I hate scones. It is. Every day and night. More tea, sir? Eventually, <laughs> Martin goes, okay, I will Fine, come, I'll come. come to your bloody house for tea. He's like, oh, marvellous, wonderful. He arrives and there is Herbert with tea laid out, lovely, lovely vats of tea and a lot of scones, a lot of (laughs) buttered scones are on the table. Nice. (laughs) This is on the 26th of October, 1921. And they sit down, Martin expecting just to wrap up all the business affairs. Herbert sort of scurries round that. He just wants to make small talk, steering away from business. And at one point he picks up a buttered scone, says, skews fingers and hands it straight to Martin. Nice. Just like, puts it in his mouth. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Martin eats it, probably because he's staring at him. It's like, okay, I'm getting really weird. <laughs> Buttering scones as he's watching him. <laughs> so Martin eats the scone, probably backs out of the house. Like, this was lovely. Thank mm. you. When he gets home, he is violently ill. No. Mm. Now, Martin is sick for several days. He is visited by the same doctor who treated Catherine Armstrong. He thankfully recovers. But this is an instance where local chatter, the connections in town, actually help him. His father-in-law, the chemist, remember? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He notes Martin's symptoms. And he is aware, having gone to have tea with Herbert Armstrong, he's saying, look, Herbert Armstrong has bought a lot of arsenic from me. A lot. He's had two or three visits for dandelions and even I can bloody see there's no dandelions. <laughs> there's no dandelions left in Wales or England at this stage. Dr. Hinks, who treated Catherine Armstrong, notes the similarities between the two cases. Then Martin remembers something as they're all having these conversations and saying, this is a bit strange. And Martin goes, uh, okay. I maybe should have brought this up earlier, but a few weeks ago, I received an anonymous box of chocolates at my house. (laughs) And I just thought it was a nice thing. People send me chocolates. I'm a very nice lawyer. I was having a dinner party, so I just handed them around. And my sister-in-law ate one, and she became very, very sick. So we did look at the 
chocolates to see if there were any signs of spoilage. And we, we did notice tiny, tiny holes on the bottom of them. <laughs> Almost syringe-shaped. Almost syringe-shaped holes. Um, so, yeah, maybe there was something wrong. Doctor and mm. the father-in-law go, you think? Yeah, possibly. Why did you not bring this up before? What did you think that was? It's enough to concern everybody. Yes, everyone should be concerned, I feel. This is good because everyone is now talking to each other. They've, they've put two and two together. The doctor has redeemed himself from just having the woman committed for being poisoned. The doctor sends off Martin's urine for, a, for analysis. And the family also inform the police of what's happened mm. in the background. The police don't want to make a move too soon. They're saying, okay, this is, maybe it's coincidence, but there's enough here. So they start watching Herbert Armstrong. All the while, Herbert has continued to pester Martin to come down for more tea. Again, being seen buying tea and buns in huge supplies. Like, look, I've got enough. I've got all the buns. Come over. I'm ready. I've got a different blend. The tests show definite traces of arsenic. Mm in Oswald Martin's system. So the authorities now order the exhumation of Catherine Armstrong's mm. body and they find it riddled with, with arsenic. Scones. With scones. <laughs> Death by scones. <laughs> She's been buried and ironically dandelions have woven through her corpse. <laughs> I'm just imagining her lying there, two scones on her eyes. <laughs> To pay the fairy one. <laughs> oh, they're my favourite. Great. <laughs> oh, cheese scones. I like cheese scones. These are bloody currants in them. Get back, you woman. They brush aside all the scones crumbs. <laughs> but they find her body riddled with arsenic. And who performs the second autopsy? Is it the doctor? No. No. It's Bernard Spilsbury. Ooh! Hey! He's a fancy man. There he is. He's getting on a bit now, I think, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah in the 20s. But... Herbert is arrested, of course protesting his innocence. And many people are behind Herbert Armstrong. They think he is a respectable lawyer. He's not just a respectable lawyer. He is the head of his own firm. He's got, you know, notable positions in the whole area. Absolutely. He has a big house. He couldn't possibly do anything he doesn't. He's a major in the Territorial this Army. Is he true. has pre- defended his country. Couldn't possibly be him. Maybe one of the red flags should have been that when he's arrested, he literally has bags of arsenic on him. Nice. Little tiny grains of it, but he has like supplies. <laughs> Maybe a bit smaller, in his pockets, in his desk. It's like a hole all full of white powder. <laughs> At trial in April 1922, the defence argues that Mrs. Armstrong was suicidal and she had taken the poison herself. Yes, there was arsenic in the house. There's arsenic in every bloody house this those days. Yes. She has taken the poison. She was delusional. She spent time in an asylum. She was seeing Mm. visions. She was domineering. She was losing her mind and miserable. And this was her way out. The prosecution come back and they report her last words and say, well, that doesn't sound like the words of someone who's really miserable. That sounds like someone who has a lot Mm. to live for. They belie this idea. And Bernard Spilsbury again states the amount of arsenic in her body. It is not possible that she could have taken all of that herself the doctor confirms this as well it's not possible it had to have been by poisoning Mm -hmm. if you have that much for arsenic at once what's going to happen you're going to throw it up it's going to it's going to come out of your system so it then transpired that just before her death herbert had drawn up a new will for his wife yes in 1920 he had made himself her sole beneficiary because she had originally planned to leave all of her money that she'd received as an income from his business she was leaving it all to the kids oh Mm. The new will was written in his handwriting nice. and had a very badly forged signature at the bottom. <laughs> with a picture of a scone. <laughs> Stamped with a scone. Stamped with a scone. Stamped with a scone. <laughs> Much is made that he had not chosen to draw on his wife's inheritance. Mm-hmm. So if he was the sole beneficiary, why didn't he take that money? Why didn't he use it to pay back Oswald Martin? People don't really know why he didn't. Maybe it's because he bloody knew that he'd forged the will and he didn't want any more questions yeah, raised that people looking at soon. it or examining it, yes, mm. maybe. And soon in the court, the stories of his affairs come out. There's even, comes out in court, a tale of him visiting a prostitute while his wife was in an asylum and contracting an STD. Nice. They didn't say which one it was. I mean... <laughs> Any of the any, any of, of the them above. Not, not great, really. Any of the above. <laughs> Thrush. The judge himself questions Herbert about the weird method of poisoning dandelions. Herbert had taken the stand. Obviously, he's a lawyer. He mm-hmm. had answered the prosecution's questions. He'd answered the defence's questions. It was quite satisfactory. But the judge was like, oh, no, 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 come back, come back, come back, come back. Literally calls him back and goes, no, no, no. What the hell was up with the dandelion thing? In so many words. Why? 
why would you do that? He just, I love the idea the judge is fixated, <laughs> yeah. going, what? Is, you're, what's, what? What's why? And, and he can't bloody answer Herbert Armstrong. He says, mm. I don't know. I thought that was the best way of doing it. No, it's not. So yeah, that is starting to rock his own defence. Like he could have probably been fine <laughs> if the judge wasn't obsessed with the daddy lion thing. He was a keen gardener himself. Apparently so. Yeah. Yes. Trying to get hints. <laughs> Indeed. And, and also, uh, Herbert Armstrong, not a very good lawyer. He's not... Well, apparently, yeah, not prepared for a relatively obvious question, one would imagine. Yeah. So, yeah. so, after all of these back and forths, even though many people expect that Herbert Armstrong will get off, he is found guilty of um... murdering his wife by the jury. Surprise, surprise. Mm. He was sentenced to death. As I said, many people thought his good reputation would see him through, mm. but no, 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 no. He tried to appeal without luck, and he was hanged on the 31st of May, 1922. And his last words, some reported, were, Kitty, I'm coming to you. No. Mm. Some people have disputed that. Yeah. He denied his involvement in the crimes to the very end he insisted he was an innocent man and there are some people who still believe that herbert armstrong was innocent that he was framed that kitty was indeed suicidal or that oswald martin was the man who was, was behind it all he had devised the whole thing to get rid of his rival which is a much more cunning and i mean well, that's a very convoluted plot it's a good lawyerish way of doing it, though, I mean, isn't is it? it? Uh. I mean, on many of these stories we come across, and it's like, oh, but this person did it for this reason and this clever reason and this, this, this. Really? <laughs> it's like the people sitting there hundreds of years later and going, ooh, wouldn't have that been clever if this person had done that? Well, you say that th- this theory has been upheld by another lawyer who ended up moving into Herbert Armstrong's former home mm. and practising law. And he realised that he was living in his house and he met Herbert Armstrong's daughter, Margaret, who's quite old at the time. Uh-huh. And this lawyer had decided, I'm going to write a book and, and, and prove his innocence. Because, yeah, some people would say, no, he didn't. He didn't do it. Interestingly, Margaret, the daughter, she was, she was very young when her parents died. Mm. She didn't know anything, apparently, about her parents' legacy until she went to Madame Tussauds. Oh, wow. And she saw a waxwork of her father Ooh, in Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> that's not. That's not a good first imp- first time to know that your father killed your mother. There's no Google at the time. Oh, no, so well, you... indeed. Yeah. Oh, that's that's yeah. going to be upsetting. Indeed, maybe that's a bit of folklore, but uh, apparently, apparently. Mm. So, what really happened? That's for you to decide, listeners. But I told you that Herbert Armstrong was famous for something. Yes. He is the only solicitor in the UK ever to have been hanged for murder. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Come on. I mean, you, you, you're stretching famousness there, I feel. But it's not famous, but he's got he's the only one. He has the title. He holds an interesting title. <laughs> that, that, that title, that sought after and oft demanded title of only solicitor to be convicted of murder. Hanged for murder. Hanged for murder. I don't know if another one has been convicted, but right. he hanged for murder. There you go. Da, da, da. That is the story of Herbert Armstrong, the only solicitor in the UK to have been hanged for murder. <laughs> I'm, I'm slightly more going with his, his scone obsession. His scone obsession. I mean, that's, that's very impressive. Some people do... Was it in the scones? Was it in the butter? Well, that's it. Uh... Was it the butter first or the scone? Uh. (laughs) Or was he ladling cream and jam on there and he put poison and everything? You sure you don't want some more cream or jam or finger the drapes a bit? You know, yeah. (laughs) Did he make his own scones? Was he knead knead the arsenic into the dough? (laughs) Was he there churning his butter? I don't think he would have made it. He had his trusty syringe. (laughs) He was going to stuff everything full of arsenic. (laughs) Did he inspect his scones for... Syringe holes first. I do well. Maybe we should. Oh, now. We should now. Yeah. From now on, you will. If you ever get chocolates through the post, expect it for tiny little <laughs> syringe holes. There was also talk after the trial that did he kill the cheeses? Oh, husband and wife died husband within wife a day is. of each other. Mm. Then he got hold of the fern. Mm. Mm. Slaughtering cheeses <laughs> to make his scones. Cheese scones. He made cheese scones. scones. Cheese scones. It all fits. It all fits. <laughs> We've cracked it. And so there you go. There is a story. Poisonous story. Poisonous story. Well done. See, it had arsenic, it had scones, it had tea, it had dandelions. It had a what more crazy do you woman, want? crazy wife who's saying, come home for bath time. What do you think then? Do you think he did it or do you think he was framed? I think potentially he may have done it. Obviously he was carrying on with other people. Obviously his wife, I mean, yeah, of course, don't kill people. But his wife did seem a bit of a nutter and probably not the easiest woman to to be living with mm. if he wants to 
go out and have jolly times, and she's going, now come home from, come home for your monthly bath. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or knocking on people's doors or down the pub going, no, come out, you can't leave the pub, it's time for your bath. Yeah. And it's not going to do much for your reputation around town or anything. No. If you're trying to be a serious grown-up lawyer, and your wife's coming in saying it's bath time, it's not great. And he's feeling quite oppressed by her. Yeah. And as a lawyer, he's also going to know what the costs are going to be if... Uh... If he files so, for divorce, yeah. then she's got entitlement for the kids and for maintenance and everything. And if so he, if he's out and about there having fun with the younger ladies, pretty young things um, in in town and what have you. So I uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he he did bumped off his wife. He he did do it. I I can't imagine. I don't know if he did do the, the cheesemans and things as well. I think I think potentially he was just in a very unhappy marriage, unfortunately. Mm. But then um, he tried to kill Oswald Martin. Well, that is no, that's that's a very good point. He yeah. did indeed. So. Having killed one person, suddenly yeah. he gets bold and thinks, "Ooh, maybe well, I can." It's that sort of thing. I mean, does that one thing lead you to another? Say, "Oh, I've got away with this. Yeah. Therefore, well, I can get away with it again." Mm. And therefore, you stop planning on. Well, they really pissed me off twenty years ago. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, that's it. It's like killing Catherine solved mm. all of his problems at home and then he was like yeah I'm happy and then he thinks well that was so easy and no one questioned it well Oswald Martin he comes round and I'll just slip him a bit of poison he'd you obviously think... sent him poison chocolates oh, yeah, but you think, why didn't he just sort of take the inheritance take the insurance or yeah. the, the money that was in her name that he then got pay off his debts and be done with it sort of mm. The sort of person who is going to willingly kill well, your like, wife, you're going to end once, up going, oh, this is a really easy way well, to send my permanent. It's something once you've done it once and you've got away with it, then belief that you are, well, I've done it once, I can do it again, <laughs> yeah. type of thing. Lowers your respect for the for human life. Well, for sure, absolutely. Yeah, there you go. Well, what do you think, people? Do you know the story of Herbert Armstrong and his scone based killings? Scone based death. How do you kill dandelions? What is the most effective way of killing weeds? Uh, well, syringe, one at a time. Syringe, clearly, yes. Yeah. I worry about it, like, you know, using poison or anything or toxins to, to harm neighbourhood cats. I find boiling water works. It doesn't. What, other neighbourhood cats? Uh, yes, it keeps them away. <laughs> then they won't eat the poison. It's not a popular garden. No, I can imagine not. <laughs> Do you think Herbert did it? Do you think he was framed by Oswald Martin, who constructed this incredible, elaborate scheme to frame him and get rid of his rival, nope. and no suspicion would ever fall upon him? <laughs> <laughs> How do you like to have your scones? Well, this is true. Yes. With arsenic or without? I mean, it's optional. No. Which goes on first? Say, now I want scones. No, oh, I know. I was going to bring you scones. You were good. And you didn't. You failed miserably in your duties. Well, I made you a lovely cocktail. Yeah, scone. With, scone on top would be better. Yeah. Garnish your scone. Just, well, given that... <laughs> on a knitting we... needle on the... <laughs> <laughs> on a dandelion. <laughs> on a dandelion. <laughs> a syringe. Would well, have been perfect. Yeah, well, but given that actually the, the drink that I made, the, the non-alcoholic bramble, was absorbed by all of the crushed ice, I think introducing a scone to it would have just been a step too far. <laughs> There'd be no liquid left in your house. <laughs> Tell us what you think of the story. Jump on the comments, send us your thoughts and your musings. And most importantly, mix up some lovely drinks this Friday. Yes, do indeed. So we have the lovely uh, Who Lives Here. That was a very good quarter. I like that. Yes, try that one. And then, what I mean, what do, so you're so non-alcoholic Colleague Bramble, is that what we're going with? Yeah, let's call it that. One of those as well. I think I think we must have a more interesting name. Oh, uh, a Brambalicious? Brambalicious. Brambalicious. That's depressing. Uh, <laughs> so, Nick's Who Lives Here or Sinead's Brambalicious. Yeah. Take your pick. <laughs> Choose wisely. The recipes will be out this evening so you can mix them up and make any variant that you like. Keep tagging us in your photos of the cocktails that you're enjoying and that you're mixing up. We love to see them and we love to share them. When we do put out episodes, make sure you comment on our social media posts as well so that more people will find them. It's really good for our algorithms and we love to hear your comments and your thoughts about our episodes each week. Join the conversation and make sure you check out Patreon if you haven't already. Lots, lots more episodes episodes and bonus content on there for you to enjoy every single week and as we go into february and dry january finally dries up <laughs> send us suggestions of more mini episodes and content that you'd like to hear from us on the main show that we can provide for you in these crazy times <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Oh.